All right, guys, so we've had the Bible reading from Genesis 37. If you can just open back to Genesis 37. Uh, we're going to go through the following chapters of Genesis as well. But as you realize, that if you notice, that chapter is really the beginning of the story of Joseph. Joseph is mentioned in previous chapters of his birth, but this is really when we get into his personal story. And I thought it would be such a good thing to go through the story of Joseph um, in a summarized form, because I think it really applies to the situation we're in at the moment. Um, the title of the sermon that I have for you this morning is New Beginnings. New Beginnings. So this is New Life Baptist Church in Sydney. Okay, when I thought of the word new life, I was thinking about the new life we have in Christ. You know, being born again, having that new man in you, and being able to live for the glory of God, being able to do the works of God. But when I'm thinking about New Life Baptist Church in Sydney, new life can also apply to new beginnings. You know, we, go through, we all go through hardship in life. We all go through difficulties. You know, we all get through depression. We get saddened. You know, unfortunately, this life is not always a bed of roses. You know, this life will always throw its curveballs and its challenges. And every now and again, we just need a new beginning. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, this church represents a new beginning. Okay, for many of you. Okay. Now, if we look at verse number 3, Genesis 37, verse 3. I, I love the story of Joseph. Because he had many new beginnings. All right, he had many new beginnings. So if we're going to learn about new beginnings, he's probably the best person to look at in the Bible. So Genesis 37, verse 3. It says, Now Israel, so that's Jacob, that's the father of, of Joseph. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now the first thing I just want to throw out to you there, guys, it is never a good, for, for parents, mums and dads, it's never a good idea to favor any child. Okay, this was a mistake of Israel. You know, don't get in the habit of thinking, oh, just because they're Old Testament saints, just because God used them in a, in a, in a, in a great way, doesn't mean they, they didn't make mistakes. Many times you read the Old Testament, you're like, really? This person did that? Like, you know, really? Moses killed a man? You know, really? King David committed adultery? You know, this was a mistake of Israel. This was a mistake of Jacob that he took a child that he favored over his brethren. And of course, if you're going to favor a child, how are the other children going to think? Mm -hmm. I mean, if any of you guys that know that have children, you know you're not trying to favor any of them. But it doesn't matter. You know, the other kids will always think, oh, that one's the favorite. You know, it doesn't, it's just it's already there instilled in a child's mind, mind. But if you're favoring one, how much more are they going to be jealous? How much more are they going to grow bitter? over Joseph. But if we want to take a spiritual application of this, okay, us being children of the Heavenly Father, you know, God favors us. You know, God shows His favor upon us, not because we're a respecter of persons, but because we're in Christ. We're in His only begotten Son. If you're saved, you have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon you, and you are favored in the sight of the Heavenly Father, above everybody else in this world that is unsaved. Not because you're special, but because you're in Christ Jesus. Okay? So if we take that spiritual application there, let's drop down to verse 13. Genesis 37, verse 13. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. And that's what I love about Joseph. You know, his father asks him, Look, I want to send you out. Um, and Joseph says, here am I. And I think as all of us, as children of the Heavenly Father, we ought to be thinking of, of ourselves, making ourselves available to His sending. Where, whatever we read in the Bible, whatever challenges we have in, 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 in uh, living a more godly life, in going out and preaching the gospel, in being in church, reading the scriptures, praying to Him, whatever instructions we see, you know, keeping the commandments, keeping the laws of God, we ought to say to the Heavenly Father, here am I. And this is just a picture of Joseph, an obedient son. I'm not surprised that his fa father favored him. His other sons were getting into mischief. But Joseph was always obedient and was always honest toward his father. And look, at, look at verse 14. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. And he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So we see the father sending Joseph. He trusts that Joseph would go and bring an honest report of what was going on with his brethren. Now you're saying, why is he sending Joseph? We can just look at verse number two. Go back up to verse number two. 
It says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. By the way, that's, those are the rebellious years. Right? I mean, you might have a two-year-old or three-year-old go, wow, they're really rebellious. No, it's when they get into the teenage years and around this, this age when, when they're becoming you know, mature-minded and, and they have those hormones raging in their bodies. And uh, it's, it's this age where you know, you're kind of like, do I really trust a you know, 17-year-old? But yet we, we see Joseph's attitude. We see his behavior. He was someone that the father could trust. And then, uh, what was it after? Uh, verse number two. two. Verse number two. That's right, yeah. And uh, with, with his brethren, and the lad, uh, sorry, Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. So Joseph, seeing that the brethren are up to evil, up to no good, they're not doing the work that the father has left them to do, he reports back to dad with that evil report, with, with the truthful report that they're not doing the work. So Joseph had a reputation that he was, he was honest. You know, even with his brothers that he loved, that he grew up with, you know, if they were disobeying mum and dad, you know, he would go back and bring that honest report so that the parents would be able to do something right, you know, be able to correct their children. You know, he wasn't someone that gave half-truths. He always gave an honest report of, of the events, okay? And this is what got his brothers angry with him, you know? Because he's making them look bad. But really, Joseph wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, he was just being obedient to his father. And so this is again why his father sends him out and says, Can you please check on your brethren? Can you bring me back report? You know, obviously the father wants a good report. He wants Joseph to come back and say, Yeah, dad, they're working hard. You know, they're working hard with the flocks. And, and uh, you, know, you know, they're not embarrassing the family name or anything like that. So let's look at verse 18. Let's see what, let's see what happens. Verse 18. So this is now the, the brothers of Joseph. Verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Okay? And verse 19, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. We won't go through the dream of Joseph today, but uh, you guys know, you, we read through that dream. And then verse 20, Come now therefore, and let us slay him. Think about this. This is your own family, your brothers, saying, Let's kill him and cast him into some pits. And we will say, some evil beast had devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. You know, in your attempts to be a faithful and honest Christian, in your attempts to just know the Lord more, in your attempts to be able to preach the gospel to your lost family members, don't be surprised if your family members turn around and hate you. Don't be surprised if your best friends, the people that you love the most, that you want to see saved, will hate you. You know, all you want, you're excited. All you want is to be able to give them the gospel. I've got good news. Salvation is by faith on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's not of works. It's not of any church. You know, you can have freedom. You can have liberty right now. You can know 100% sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're on your way to heaven. You want to give them that beautiful message. But they'll hate you for it. You know, this is a spiritual book. You know, this is not understood by the natural man. You know, you give them such a beautiful message and they think you're attacking them. They think you're attacking their religion. They think you're, you're attacking their good works. When all you want to do is show them the way to heaven. And in the same way that the brothers responded to him, people will hate you just for standing up for the truth. Just for trying to live an honest Christian life. There's nothing that Joseph had done wrong. Okay? It wasn't his fault that his father had favored him. Okay? Look at verse number 28. So they take Joseph, you know the story, they take Joseph, they throw him into this pit. There's some arguments between the brothers, what they should do with him, whether they should kill him or, or, or what. But in verse 28, then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the uh, Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. So they sell him into slavery. This, 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 this son, this 17-year-old man, you know, who was a favorite of his father, who was doing nothing but right by his family, finds himself sold into slavery and taken into a foreign land, taken into Egypt. Do you think he expected that? Do you think when his dad says, you know, you know can I send you? He says, here am I, that he's going to find himself the next day as a slave? Of course not. You know, he, then this is life. You know, life can be going well. Life can be on track. 
But all of a sudden that curveball comes. All of a sudden that trial, that tribulation comes your way. And all of a sudden you find yourself where you never expected. You know? And obviously I would expect Joseph to be upset. I would expect him to be afraid. I would expect him to not know what his future holds. You know, not know whether I will ever see my father again. Not know if I'll ever, you know, get married and have my own family or anything like this. You know, he'd gone from being the favored son to now being a slave on his way to Egypt. Look at verse, uh, chapter 37. Genesis 37. Uh, we're in 37, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, well, let's look at verse 31 quickly. Verse 31. And they took Joseph's coat, so the, the, the coat that his father gave him, and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. So we see Joseph betrayed by his own brothers, right? His brothers had sold him into slavery, had thrown him into that pit. And in order to cover that up, they had to take that coat, kill an animal, cover it with the blood, and lie to the father that, that Joseph had been killed. And let me warn you about lying. You know, if you do something wrong, it's just best to come out and admit it. Even if it's, you know, you might think, I'll get away with it. But what we see is that you've got to come up with another lie to cover that lie. And if you've ever lied, we've all lied in our lives, and especially, you know, probably as young you know, people that have done foolish things, you know that when you tell a lie, you've got to tell another lie. And to cover that lie, you've got to tell another lie. Another lie. Another lie. And then you've got this huge burden upon you, and you're like, man, it'd just be easy if I just told the truth. You know? And then eventually it comes out anyway. So you might as well just tell the truth the first time. Right? You know, with our children, when we, when we discipline our kids, they get more in trouble just for lying. You know, even if what they did might have been worse, to us the lying is even worse. You know, that they would lie to us or cover up something that was done wrong. It's better if they just come out, tell the truth, get that one smack, rather than lie and then get five smacks. That's what happens, by the way, with our, with our family, okay? It's worse when you lie. We're trying to teach them from a young age, it's worse. It's worse for you. It's, 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 it's a harsher punishment if you lie. Just tell the truth and, and admit to it. Uh, so let's look at verse, 30, uh, verse 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So we see he gets sold to, to Potiphar, obviously a slave, but he gets sold, thank, thankfully, because God was with him, he gets sold into a, a rich man's house. Someone that is a captain of the guard. He holds a high um, uh, level within Pharaoh, within, within uh, I'm assuming this is like an army, in, in Egypt's army. So, you know, at least... He goes to a place that he's going to be looked after. Okay, He's going to have to work hard, but it's a place that he's going to be looked after. Now, we won't look at verse 30, uh, chapter 38. Please go to chapter 39. Genesis 39. Because uh, chapter 38 doesn't really cover much of Joseph at all. We get to chapter 39, verse number 1. We pick up the story here. Genesis 39, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, Brought, uh, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord, pay attention to those words, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You know, in the difficulties in your life, when things don't go according to plan, if you're a child of God, if you're saved, you can have the assurance, even though everything else is falling apart, your finances, your relationships, you know, your marriage might be hurting. You know, your friends might be turning their backs against you. Your family may have sold you into slavery, if you will. You know, your th things might be going so bad in your life, but there's one assurance that you'll always have that we see there in verse number two. And the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with you. Not just when things are going well, but when things are going bad. You know, when there's those trials. And that, that means you can turn to him. And sometimes it might feel like he's so far away. But no, if you're a child of the king, he is with you. Okay, He is with you and he'll help you through those trials. In many times, God allows these trials in our lives just so we can draw ourselves closer to him. Because I don't know if you find this. 
I find that when life is going really well, it's really easy, I tend to forget about God a little bit. I start to put away the Bible. Everything's going really well. Mm-hmm. And then when the trials hit, you know, I need the Lord. <laughs> you know, where's that Bible? Let me hear some preaching. I need to get back on board. Where's the Lord? He seems so far away. Let me reach out to Him. Sometimes we need those trials just to make sure that the Lord is with us. We maintain a close relationship with the Lord. Verse, uh, verse number 5. So Genesis 39 verse 5. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in his house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favoured. You know, when you go through those trials... You can come out of that in two ways. You know, you, you either come out worse or you come out even better. You know, and we see Joseph, he was honest. He was a hard worker. You know, he always tried to please his father. And even when he sold into slavery, into an unknown foreign nation, an unknown family, he makes the best of a bad situation. You know, Joseph says, it doesn't matter what's happened. I'm going to have a new beginning here in Egypt. I'm going to have a new beginning here in this house. And, he, and the Lord is with him. The Lord blesses him. He works hard. He, he basically, uh, Potiphar, gives Joseph full control of the household. You know, he sees that the Lord is blessing him. He sees that Joseph is prosperous. You know, he's come out of this, uh, this pit. He's come out of this slavery and he's making a name for himself. But he's away from his family. He's lost everything that he had before. But we see the heart of Joseph. He goes, no, no matter what situation I'm in, I'm going to make the best of a bad situation. And let me say to you, if you're in a bad situation, you've just got to say, hey, I'm going to make the best of where I am right now. And I'm going to see where the Lord can lead me. I'm going to see how the Lord can bless me. I'm going to see how the Lord will prosper me. And if you have that attitude, we see that it's not just Joseph that's been blessed. But Potiphar himself, Potiphar's family, you know, the people that that you interact with will be blessed just by knowing you, just by working with you. You can be a blessing to other people even when things have gone sour for you, okay? I just ask, like, are you a blessing? You know, are you a blessing to other people around you? Think about that. When things go bad, you know, are you the negative one? Are you dragging everybody down? And look, there's going to be that time. There's going to be times that you have the negative, you know, the negative one. There's going to be times when you're depressed and you need to work your way out of that. But, you know, you need to be the person that's positive. You've got to be the one that says, you know what? Yes, it's a bad situation, but we're going to make the best of what we've got and encourage and bless other people around you. If we want to be like Joseph, that's what Joseph was like. That's how we have the new beginnings. You know, we make the best of that bad situation and we try to be a blessing to other people around you. You know, when, when you're thinking of others, when you're thinking of other people around you, you're less likely to be, you know, um, selfish and self-centered and, and have that pity party for yourself. Look at me, I'm in such a bad state. When you look out for the needs of others, you stop focusing upon yourself and you start focusing on the needs of others. And that's what Joseph did. He started to look, hey, I'm going to help uh, Potiphar. It's not his fault, but I'm going to bless him. I'm going to try to work hard for him. Let's look at verse number seven. And it came to pass after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused. I love that about Joseph. He refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold my master, what if not what is with me in the house? And he hath committed all that he hath in my hand. You know, this is just a warning again when life is going well. Joseph is back on his feet, serving the Lord, being a blessing, in charge of the whole house. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. When things are going really well, you need to be careful. Because one bad mistake can cause you to fall. You need to be aware of the situation. And we have here, uh, Potiphar's wife wanting to have an inappropriate relationship with with, uh, uh, Joseph. Now, maybe Joseph could have got away with it. I don't know. But again, we see his character. And he says, no, that that is wrong. That is not something that I can do. I cannot betray uh, my master. Look at verse number 10. Verse number 10. And it came to pass 
And by the way, this is probably, this is Joseph's probably one major fault in his life. And it came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, so constantly, every day, asking him to have that relationship with her, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. But look at verse number 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there with there within. Now, I think Joseph should have realized this woman is, is, is a whore. This woman is inappropriate. And there's no other people in this house right now. And I think if he was just a little bit wiser in this moment, he would not have entered that house himself. Okay, so he found himself alone with Potiphar's wife here. And verse number 12, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So when it comes to temptation, when it comes to sin, one um, legitimate response to overcoming temptation in your, in your life is to flee, to like physically remove yourself from that situation. Okay, if you're in a situation where your friends are tempting you to get drunk, to take drugs or whatever, to, to look at you know, women that are not your wife, look at men that are not your husband, you need to get out of that situation. You know, you need to physically remove yourself. You need to flee from that. We see that's what Joseph did. Okay, immediately he said, I don't know how to overcome this. I'm just going to get out of here. You know, he, he got out so fast that he forgot his jacket. He left it behind. You know, she took, it, she took that jacket or that, or that coat uh, that belonged to him. And look, let's look at verse 19. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, because she, had, she, she was saying that he tried to come and rape her. You know, she was trying to turn this against Joseph. And he came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. So... I mean, he's, he's got it going well. He had that new beginning. He makes a mistake, you know, going into this house with this, this, this whorish woman, you know. And he does the right thing. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't give in to the temptation. He, he flees from the sin. You know, he does what's right in, in, in his master's eyes. He does what's right in the Lord's eyes. And where does he find himself? In prison. Again, hey, sometimes you're just doing the right thing. Sometimes you're just going by life, and yet again, life throws a new curveball, a new trial, a new difficulty, a new tribulation. You know, and it's like, what? I'm in prison now? You know, and again, I think we can all relate to just challenges we've had. If you've, maybe the, not the kids so much, but if, you, if you've lived long enough, you've gone through difficulties that you just go, I don't know where this came from. It's not my fault, it's, but here it is. It's on my lap. And I, what do I do with it? You know? And... Again, we can get down, we can get discouraged. But I don't, know, I don't think anyone here has been sold into slavery. I don't think anyone here has been thrown into prison. Unless someone wants to admit that right now. Has anyone been thrown into prison for, for a reckless past? <laughs> no, no one wants to admit that. Look, un unless you've gone through these difficulties, you know, you can do what Joseph does. You can make a new beginning of a bad situation. Okay? If you've gone through Joseph and even worse, then I'll forgive you if, you, if you're down in dumps. And depressed and can't get out of that, right? But until you're sold into slavery in prison, I expect everybody in this church, and myself included, to be able to have that new beginning. Doesn't matter how difficult a situation can be. Now, uh, let's look at verse number uh, 21. Verse number 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. You see that again? In our difficulties, the Lord is with us. And showed him mercy. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was a door of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So do we see Joseph down in the dumps, depressed? <laughs> Getting bitter about what his brothers did? Is he getting bitter about what Potiphar's wife did to him? No. He makes the best of a bad situation. He starts, you know, helping in the prison. You know, uh, the prison 
what, what are they calling the prison? The keeper of the prison looks at Joseph and goes, Wow, this guy's really prosperous. This guy's a real blessing. This guy's a hard worker. He's in prison. He's locked up. <laughs> and yet he's still doing the best that he can. He's trying to be a blessing to this prison keeper. To the point that he's no longer really a prisoner. He's running the things. He's the manager of the prison. You know, and whatever they did, it was, it was Joseph's idea. He was the one... You know, keeping, and I'm sure, look, we don't know much what's going on, but I'm sure all the prisoners there are being blessed by, by having Joseph as their, you know, prison, you know, uh, manager, if you, if you will, you know. But Joseph was a man of new beginnings, you know, he was a man of new beginnings. And again, this church, New Life Baptist Church in Sydney, is a new beginning for many of you, you know. I, I know it's hard, look, it, it's hard. To be despised by the world and to go through difficulties by the unsafe people and you know unsafe family but it's even more hurtful when you've gone through difficulties we've saved brethren when you've gone through difficulties with your own brothers in the lord who you love in the lord who have been saved by the blood of the crucified one you know and we sometimes think that christians ought to have more mercy more patience you know uh, more humility you know more meekness but sometimes when we go through difficulties just with our fellow brethren, it can hurt them more. You know, it can hurt more. And this church is a new beginning. I hope you see this church as a new beginning. Okay? I'm committed to this church if you're committed to making this happen. You know, I want to be like Joseph. You know, I want Joseph to be in our mind. Hey, as long as we're not slaves, you know, we can make the best of a bad situation. Now, verse chapter 40. We want to look at chapter 40. Go to 41. But chapter 40 is the story where, if you guys know the story, where uh, Pharaoh sends his butler and his um, the baker. Yeah, that's right. The butler and, and his baker to prison. And then they dream dreams and then Joseph helps them interpret those dreams. You know, the butler, it was the butler, that w was restored to Pharaoh and the baker was put to death. Okay, But Joseph was able to tell the interpretation of these dreams. Because God had given him the ability to do so. So that's chapter 40. You can read it in your own time, in your house if you want to. But let's get to chapter 41. Chapter 41, verse 1. And it came to pass at the end of two full years. So Joseph was in prison for at least two full years, maybe longer. Okay? That Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. So we're not going to look at the, at the dream in any sort of detail. Let's, look, let's go to verse 15. Verse 15. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, because what happened was the, uh, the butler, you know, uh, sorry, Pharaoh dreamed this dream and nobody could interpret, could interpret it for him. You know, he was bothered by the dream and nobody could interpret. All the, the people that he had in the area could not, but the butler remembered, hey, there was Joseph. There was Joseph in the prison that interpreted my dream correctly. And, and not just my dream, but the, 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 um, the, baker. the baker's dream, you know. Uh, and, and so he reminds, you know, Pharaoh, there's this man in prison. So Pharaoh takes Joseph and brings him before him. And verse 15, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream <laughs> to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, and I love this about Joseph. Right? I mean, he's a successful man. He's a prosperous man. No matter what situation you put him in, he's doing well. But is he filled with pride? Is he, is he praising himself? No. Verse 16, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know, and I, I, I really I find it frustrating when I see good Christian men, godly men, lifted up in pride. You know, for the abilities they have, whether it's just a teaching ability, whether it's just wisdom, whether it's organizing or running a church or just being a great leader and having people behind them. And then you see them lifted up in pride. You know, this, this happens so many times. They lift it up in pride and yet they, then they fall. They fall into some major sin. You know, the Lord's hand of chastisement comes strongly upon him. I've seen this over and over and over. I've been a Christian for most of my life. You know, I was saved at four years old. My mom gave me the gospel. We've been in church pretty much my whole life. You know, I've seen this in churches or stories of other churches where pastors and preachers are lifted up in pride and then they come tumbling down. You know, and Joseph could be prideful. 
for all the success that he has in his life. And yet it says, it's not in me. It's not me, Pharaoh. It's God. God gave me the ability. God is the one that's going to answer uh, your dream. Verse 29. Verse 29. Um, Behold. So, so uh, Pharaoh gives him the dream. And then uh, Joseph, he starts to interpret the dream for him. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following. For it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, it... We see that the land of Egypt is going to go through this major uh, drought. There's going to be a major shortage of food. Food, You know, probably many tens of thousands of people will die. It doesn't just affect Egypt. We see that it affects the surrounding nations because later on we see Joseph's brother having to travel into Egypt to, to buy food. And then we sort of understand, well, hold on. These difficulties, these challenges that Joseph was put through, that the Lord was with him. He was leading up to this point. You know, we might not understand why. Why, sl- why in slavery? Why in prison? And yet, what did we see from Joseph? That he would make the best of a bad situation. That he would always have a, a new beginning. Doesn't matter what situation he's in. And so he was the man that, was, that God was preparing to help the nation of Egypt. Yes, an ungodly nation. But remember, you can be a blessing to everybody around you. You know, God can use you in, in a mighty way. And, he, you know, it, it was him. He was the one that was going to be brought to this situation. Seven years of famine. And was he going to make the best of a bad situation? Yes, he was. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> and by the way, if you want to be someone, and I, I look at, I see this in Joseph. If you want to be someone that's promoted, like in your workplace, or just promoted in life in general, you know, you don't just come, and this is, this, is like, this is something that I learned from one of my managers in the past. Because sometimes I, I'd see problems in the workplace, I'd see issues or we could, you know, things could be done better, and I'd go to my manager with a problem. I'd say, look, this is a problem. And my manager once said to me, you know what, Kevin, you know, finding problems is easy. You know, when you come with a problem, you need to bring a solution. You know, like, and I, I love that. I just thought, yeah, that's right. You know, when I see this issue, you know, if I, if I don't have a solution, I won't even bring it up. You know, because maybe it's, it's the best that it can be right now. But if I have a solution, then my manager's going to listen, hear me. And then when I had employees under me, and they bring problems, I would say the same thing. Fine, come with me with your problems, but I'll, I need you to come with a solution as well. Okay? Um, and this is exactly what Joseph is. This is why he's always promoted. He finds an issue, he goes, yeah, okay, this is an issue, but we can fix it. We can make this better. We can be more efficient. We can be more productive. You know, with with the wisdom that God had given him. But look at verse 33. Genesis 41, verse 33. This is Joseph speaking. So after he interprets the the dream to Pharaoh, he says, Now therefore, let Pharaoh... So he's advising Pharaoh. He says, Now therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man, discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. And the food shall be for store, and the land against the the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt. And the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of all his servants. We, We see here exactly how Joseph was promoted. We see that he wasn't just... A problem, hey, these are problems. He goes, I have a solution, Pharaoh. You need to appoint men. We need to gather as much food during these plenteous years so we can then survive during this time of famine. You know, this, is, this impresses Pharaoh. Wow. Not just an interpreter of dreams, but a solution maker. All right, this guy's able to fix things. Let's look at verse number 40. Pharaoh says to, to Joseph, Thou shalt be over my house, the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. He says, you'll be over my house. All my family, all my servants, Joseph, you're in charge now, (laughs) right? And according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. So really, Joseph's ruling Egypt, right? Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. 
I'll be the boss, but you take care of it. <laughs> right? I'll, I'll, I'll relax, you know, I'll retire, but Joseph, you're running things. You know, only I'm, 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 I'm the boss of you, though. Verse 41, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, you know, a sign of authority, and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. Now, this is another new beginning for Joseph. Another new beginning. Things are just getting better and better. I mean, it was good. The favored son of his father. It was good back then, right? And then sold into slavery. Then, you know, uh, serving Potiphar and, and, and uh, being prosperous and, and in charge of Potiphar's house. You know, he was, a, he, was a, he was a famous man. He was a rich man. He was a captain. Then in prison, you know, and forgotten there for two years. You know, I mean, if you're in prison for two years, Surely you'd come to a point where you think, the Lord's not here, the Lord's not here, he must have deserted me. But no, he made the best of a bad situation, he's remembered, he's able to interpret this dream of Pharaoh, and he's risen now to basically be the king of, of Egypt. For all intents and purposes, he's running the show. He's running the show. You know, and, and this is a new beginning for Joseph. So let's, let's, uh, su- let's summarize now the story here. We won't go uh, through everything right now. I mean, there's a lot more to tell. And I'll touch upon a few little things here. But I want to talk to you about how to have a successful new beginning. From the lessons that we see in Joseph, how can we make sure that in our lives, in this church, but also just in your life in general, how we can make sure once we go through difficulties and trials, we can have a successful new beginning. Number one, stay abiding in God. Continue abiding in Him. Continue maintaining a fellowship with him. Okay? Uh, You don't need to turn there, but Genesis 39 verse 2 said, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian, and his master saw that... Look! And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph maintained a close fellowship with the Lord. He maintained, you know, time in prayer. He maintained, you know, meditating on the Lord and trying to please Him. And always having his mind set upon heavenly things. You know, it wasn't about this world anymore. He was just seeking God. He was seeking the kingdom of God first. And the Lord was able to give him what he needed. Number one, stay abiding in God. Number two, stay reading His Word. Read the Bible. I know we tend to put the Bible aside. You know, I don't know, maybe today you've not read it for days, or maybe you've not read it for weeks or even months. It's collecting dust on your shelf, maybe. You know, but not Joseph. No, Joseph didn't have a Bible. We have an advantage over Joseph. We have all 66 books, you know, of canonized scripture available to us. But I'll just read to you Genesis 41, 38. It said, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this? In whom, sorry, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Look at verse 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed you, show, sorry, showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Where do you think God's going to show you his wisdom? Where do you think God's going to show you, you know, um, what paths you're to walk and, and, and the knowledge that you ought to have and, and being able to overcome difficulties in your life? It's found in the scriptures. Yes, you know, back then they didn't have the scriptures like we did today. The Lord spoke to Joseph in a different way through dreams and and other, you know, methods of interpretation in the gifts that he had. But today we have the scriptures. We have everything available to us that we need in life in our hands. And it's just our fault that we don't pick it up and read it enough. It's just our fault that we can't figure out how to overcome the situation because we've not spent the time. Like, it's a big book and you might be like, I don't know. Look, just, just start reading. Just turn. Just start reading. Get into a daily Bible reading plan and somewhere along the lines, the Lord, just like Pharaoh said of Joseph, the Lord will show you. The Lord will show you. He shows you through His Word, through uh, the knowledge and the wisdom that's contained in His book. If we would only just pick it up and read it. So number one was stay abiding in God. Number two, stay reading His Word. Number three, if you guys want to turn there, you might as well because you're in Genesis soon. Genesis 41. Genesis 41 verse 51. Genesis 41, 51. Number three is thank God. Yes, thank God.
for your difficulties. Thank God for your trials. You know why? Because without them, you can't have the new beginning. Right? You, if, if you're going to have that new beginning, you must have the trials first. You must be cast down first and go, you know what? I'm going to start again. I'm going to make the best of a bad situation. Genesis 41.51 says, and by the way, Joseph gets married, um, uh, an Egyptian wife, and then he, he names his two sons. Look at verse 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Look at look, look what way he says this. For God said he hath made me to forget all my toil. Toil is like all my hardships. The Lord hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. So all the, all, you know, all the great memories that he had of his father, the Lord was able to help him you know, to, to not be depressed about that situation. The Lord was able to help him forget all the troubles and the difficulties that he had. He was not a negative person. He did not focus on just the negative things. The Lord was able to make him... Obviously, he didn't forget it. Obviously, it's still in his mind. But it wasn't something that he was meditating on day and night. And quite often, when things don't go according to plan, especially when it's not your fault, when you're, not, you're the innocent party and people have attacked you, you can get into a state where you just constantly thinking about it, thinking about it, growing in, in bitterness, growing in anger, growing, you know, uh, just, just in, in that negative atmosphere, and you can get so down and depressed. But not Joseph, you know, he thanked God. He was able to say, God has helped me to forget these things, okay? Thank God for the difficult situations that you find yourself in. Verse number, uh, sorry, point number four, and, and look at verse 52 in the same chapter. Thank God for your blessings. You know, when you're going through tough times, thank God for the blessings that He's given you. Verse 52, And the name of the second, his second son, called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So he recognizes God has allowed me to be fruitful, to be blessed. You know, all these blessings and rewards, this um, prosperity that I've had in my life. And look, we've got no excuse. We live in probably the best country in the world, Australia. We have all the riches. You know, it's easy. You can get any job. You can be the garbage collector and earn a decent wage. I'm, I'm saying compared to the rest of this world. Okay, we live, you know, the rest of the world look at us and they see us as rich. They see us as prosperous. You know, God has put us in this nation. We shouldn't be complaining. We have such great blessings here. We have such great friends and, and contacts. There are great churches that we can go to and, and visit and, and learn from, from the Word of God. We have such great blessings. So even when things are going difficult, you know, thank God for the blessings. Not just for the difficulties, but for the blessings as well. And I love how he names his two sons that. You know, one after the difficulties and one after the the great fruitful you know blessings that he got from the Lord. Uh, so um, number four, the, 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 is that my final point? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Like my fifth point, Genesis fifty. Go to Genesis fifty, verse fifteen. Genesis fifty, verse fifteen. This is the final point of uh, having a successful new beginning, um, and that is let go of bitterness. Let go of bitterness. Genesis fifty, verse fifteen. And if you guys know the story, Joseph's family are suffering through this um, drought as well, of lack of food. And then uh, they come to Egypt and they meet Joseph. They don't, they don't even realize that it's Joseph for a while until Joseph reveals himself to them. You know, uh, there's a great reunion in the family. The father comes. He, he sees his, his brother Benjamin as well, his full, full-blooded brother Benjamin. And there's great peace amongst the family. The whole family moves to Egypt and they're better off than they were before. Uh, but look at verse 15. Genesis 50, verse 15. Genesis 50, verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that the father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. By the way, guys, if you've done something evil to someone in the past, do you see how it's still on their mind? They're still guilty over the evil that they've done. And I would encourage you, if you've done something wrong to someone in the past, go and fix it. Try if, if you have the ability, go and say sorry. Go and, and It doesn't matter how long ago it was. You know, otherwise, it will be a burden on your heart even into the future. And we see this. Even after uh, um, Israel passed away, we see that the, the brothers just have this guilt. And they're afraid. They're afraid that Joseph will, will hate them. Verse 16. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, 
Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now. So they're saying, hey, Joseph, you need to forgive your brethren for what they did when you were 17 years old. You know? But little do they know, Joseph has forgiven them. All right? But it's just that like guilt that eats them up. You know, but, uh, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we are thy servants. <laughs> like, don't, don't hurt us. You know, we, 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 you know, we'll serve you. We'll, we'll be your servants. And I love what he says in verse 19, Joseph. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? You know, do you think I'm going to get revenge on you? Is that my place? No, that's God's place. It's God's place to take vengeance. I'll just read to you quickly, just say where you are. Uh, Romans 12, 19. The Bible says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, someone's done wrong to you. You know, you can either choose to do one of two things. You either grow in bitterness and get your own revenge. But that's not your place. It's the place of the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. You know, let God take care of business. You know, you're going to rest the easiest at night when you, when you come to realize, you know, I'm a child of the Lord. He loves me. He knows the wrongs that people have done to me. The Lord will sort it out. The Lord has righteous judgment. I don't have righteous judgment. In fact, I could be the one that done something wrong. You know, and I'm going to make things worse if I go and get revenge. It could be, maybe it's me. The Lord knows. You know, the Lord will either take care of business here on this earth, balance the books on this earth, or if you suffer for His name's sake, you're going to get the rewards in heaven anyway for suffering for His name. You know, you, you win. You know, if you just leave it in God's hands. Otherwise, if you grow in bitterness, and you know what bitterness is, it's just pride. And, and one, of my, one of my former pastors said, to, he used to say this often, you know, almost every service, not every service, but very often in his preaching, He'd say, bitterness does not hurt the person that you're bitter against. You know, the person that you're bitter against is going through life, doesn't even realize you're bitter against them. You know, they're just, bitterness only hurts yourself. You know, you're so prideful, you're so blinded, and you're growing in this bitterness, but your pride is so strong, you don't even realize how much is destroying you. You know, mm -hmm. and it's going to affect your whole life. You're going to see the whole world with those bitter eyes. You know, and I've seen this in people where maybe in the past they've been hurt by somebody and then they can't make friendships moving forward because they think, well, this person's hurt me, everyone's going to hurt me. Because every relationship they have, they, they just they draw back to that past incident and that's, that's how they see the world now. That's the lens, that bitterness. And instead of that, it's like this attitude, oh, I've got to hurt that person before they hurt me. I've got to take advantage of that person before they take advantage of me. You know, bitterness is such a bad state to be in, you know. Um, let God take vengeance. Rest easy. I sleep like a baby at night. You know, and, you know, we've all been wronged. But I sleep easy. Oh, I've got God to take care of it. You know, however, he, maybe he already took care of it. You know, I mean, Potiphar's wife is probably burning in hell right now for the sin she committed. You know, I mean, how much harder do you think the punishment ought to be for, for uh, Potiphar's wife to have, you know, uh, caused uh, Joseph to be in, in prison? You know, she's burning in hell, most likely, you know. Uh, sorry, you're back in, you're in Genesis 50. I've lost, lost a bit of my... What was I up to? Does anyone remember? Ah, yeah, verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? So he recognizes, you know, vengeance, revenge, that's the place of God, not mine. You know, verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. You know, Joseph had every right to be bitter toward his brothers. They're the ones that sold into slavery. You know, he had all right to seek revenge in a way, right? But no, he leaves that to God. You know, he leaves it to God. And we see that he, the love that he can show to his brethren. You know, when you leave it in God's hands, even if a, if a brother in the Lord has wronged you, you know, when you leave it in God's hands, you can still show great love 
toward that brother. That's why God, you know, you know, we read the New Testament to do good to our enemies. You know, because God will do bad. You know, God will take take revenge. We can leave it in His hands. And you know, just in conclusion, again, just New Life Baptist Church in Sydney. This is a church of new beginnings. I just wanted to just clarify those five points again. Number one, stay abiding in God. Number two, stay reading His Word. Number three, thank God for your trials and difficulties. Number four, thank God for your blessings. And number five, let go of bitterness. We, we learn that from Joseph and we see the great success that he was, how he was able to press that reset button and have that new beginning. And okay, let's pray.